Hello everyone. Uh, lately I've been really noticing the uh, trend over the past decade or two of obscuring error messages from the user so that they don't see them and replacing them with things like contact your system administrator and things like that. Now that's not terribly helpful. Uh, oftentimes the person getting that error message is the system administrator. And if you're not telling them what the actual problem is, they have no way, no possible way to troubleshoot it. So they have to start guessing and that's not helpful. But even, even if that person isn't the system administrator, it's still useful to tell them what didn't work. Uh, and that is important because in most cases, when there's a problem, it's not on a corporate network or somewhere where there's an IT support staff that can come and physically look at the machine and fix it. If that was the case, then the error message would be perfectly fine because then presumably the system administrator IT staff would know how to drill down and get the message out, assuming it's in there somewhere, or they would have access to information that isn't available to the user. Uh, now, of course, the idea behind this is so that users don't tinker with their stuff when they don't have the skill or ability to fix things. But the problem is when tech support is not physically present. So if you give up a, an error message, uh, let's just pick on a specific case of receiving or sending email, configuring your email software. So you go through and you put in the settings uh, that you think are right, and you tell it to test them or to actually try it out, and it comes back and says, sending reported error. Contact your system administrator. Well, okay, good. So you know that sending messages failed. But you don't know why it failed. You don't know what happened. And there are a number of possible situations there. It could be your internet connection's broken and you can't actually get anywhere. It could be the mail server itself is down and you can't reach it. It could be a problem between you and the mail server. Or it could be you put the wrong server name or it could be you put, put the wrong username and password or, or things like that. Now, if the internet's broken or something like that, you're not going to be able to fix it. Uh, and if you can't get to anything, well, you're probably going to notice that as soon as you start poking around on, on Google or something like that. But how do you narrow down which of the other types of problems it could be? Uh, without the actual error message, you can't. You have to actually go through an iterative process of testing every possible thing until you find the thing that didn't work. Now, it wouldn't be so bad if there was a prominent uh, button or something that you could click on that would show the details of the error message. Uh, and I can certainly uh, sympathize with the notion of uh, don't show the details by default, but don't make it difficult to get them. And that's been the trend lately is hiding things in the user interface so that if you don't know how to get to it, you can't discover how to get to it. And that's definitely a bad trend. So back to the email thing. Uh, if, it, if when it failed to, uh, to connect to the email server or send the message, it would tell you the details of what it was trying to do, whether immediately or after a single click into the detail report. Uh, say you, you misspelled the mail server name, if it would say uh, failed to connect to mail server and then list the name of the server that it tried to connect to and maybe the port number and the protocol, then you'd have a chance of noticing the typo in the error message and then you go, ah, I know what the problem is. And you might not even need to call tech support or your system administrator or whatever. Or you may see that that's right and that the error message says that the username and password were rejected. Okay, then you know that you've got the wrong authentication details. Or maybe, just maybe, 
everything worked and then it rejected your message and that the and that the mail server said the message looked like spam uh, and that will also prevent the message from going out and if you can see that detail then you know that there's an issue with your email message or maybe with the mail servers filtering but then when you do contact the technical support people you can tell them what the actual error is. You can tell them what the mail server said and what have you. Even if they have to tell you to get the details on the message and read it to them, then they actually have a chance of figuring out what's going on. And that's an important point. Like, as bad as error messages ever were in the, in the bad old days with, say, Microsoft's Outlook program and their... Uh, their eight-digit hexadecimal error codes, uh, at least those error codes gave you something you could search for in Google or something like that, or that the technician could search for. And those error codes usually came with uh, some, some sort of a description of what failed. And then they started to dumb those descriptions down, and then they started hiding them all together, uh, basically as in a race to be Apple, near as I can tell. So Apple was basically the first uh, big uh, uh, company that got traction doing this sort of thing, of basically hiding all the details of what went wrong and making it impossible to get them. So that made troubleshooting very difficult. I remember in the 90s and the early 2000s, if someone called in uh, with, with trouble accessing their email and they said they were using a Mac, it was, you knew you weren't going to be able to help them uh, in probably half the cases because it wasn't going to tell you what didn't work. It just, it, the error messages were basically, it didn't work. Okay, great. How didn't it work? That's important for troubleshooting. If you don't know what part of the thing didn't work, you don't know where to, to focus your attention. And on top of that, uh, the, um, the Apple culture had conditioned most Mac users uh, that it was not their responsibility to even think about what they were doing and to check anything. So when you tried to get them to do anything to give you the information you needed, they would often come back with, well, it's broken, fix it, uh, which was totally unhelpful as well. But that's, that's a cultural issue with, the, with uh, certain groups of people. Uh, once you can manage to explain to people that, look it, I don't have any information to figure out what's wrong, you need to give me something. Uh, and then eventually you can uh, you could get them to go into their settings and tell you what they had in there. And maybe you get lucky and there was something obvious in there. You know, the, the default troubleshooting for email configuration is open up the settings, read me the settings, and then we'll see if there's something wrong in there. Uh, and, you know, sometimes that would solve it. Uh, other times uh, you have issues where the mail software itself is broken and there's not much you can do about those cases uh, where it gets stuck in a loop and just won't won't behave for some reason uh, and then it gives up the same unbroken message and with no useful information and of course those you can't fix and that's annoying but at least if you have some details in the error message you can have some idea why you can't fix it, or you can point people in a better direction. Uh, unfortunately, back in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, I actually had to tell people, go talk to Apple, get the error message. Then we can possibly help you, tell you what's not working. And, you know, oddly enough, more recent Macs, the software on them, do give you more useful error messages in these cases. Uh, and the PCs running Microsoft software are going the other way. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, just today I was talking to someone that was using a Mac and they were having issues and I was actually giving proper information in the error message when the guy actually bothered to read it to me. And eventually I tweaked on what his problem was and we were able to fix it. And 
and that was that was amazingly helpful. Uh, it was something that I wouldn't necessarily have caught <coughs> if we were just looking through the settings, because it's it's something. If I could, if I was looking, actually looking at the settings, then yeah, I probably would have seen it immediately, or very quickly anyway. But because I was I was doing this remotely over the telephone, and bef and if you're thinking, well, you should be using a, a remote desktop thing to uh, deal with that. No, I shouldn't, and the reason I shouldn't is liability. A as soon as I, as a third party, have control over somebody's computer. If anything goes wrong after that point, who's going to be blamed and how do you prove that it wasn't you? You can't. And the person is going to believe it was you, whether you can prove it one way or the other. Uh, and that's why I steadfastly refuse to take over somebody else's machine remotely. It's because it's too dangerous from a liability standpoint, even though oftentimes I'd probably be able to fix things a lot faster that way. The reason for it is it's too, too risky to me. And it also means that if I screw something up, I can seriously damage their machine and not be able to fix it. And now, because I've been directly messing with it, I'm the one that's going to have to fix it, right? Or pay to fix it. But if I never physically have access to the machine and never have remote access to the machine, then anything that they're not doing, like, then I can't be responsible for something that happens two hours after we after I'm, I'm off the phone with them because I didn't have access and also it means that I'm not training people to give random strangers on the other end of the phone access to the machine and it avoids a little bit of training people into falling for the scammers because the scammers very often do just that now in a corporate IT setting or something like that where the company owns the machine that's a different story and it's perfectly reasonable to be using remote desktop things and that sort of thing to uh, troubleshoot and, you know, and uh, fix problems. That's perfectly fine. Uh, anyway, I've gone off on a tangent here and that's, I, that's just something I do, I guess. You know, tangents are us and all. Uh, but uh, anyway, back to error messages. Uh, a proper error message that gives useful information, relevant information for troubleshooting is actually immensely useful to everybody. First, the end user who doesn't really understand this stuff may recognize the error message and may remember what the solution was from the previous time or may know what it means, uh, may recognize what it means and they may then realize that, oh, I just have to wait, you know, half an hour and things will be good and it'll start working again. Or I have to uh, restart my uh, uh, cable modem or uh, maybe my internet's broken or something like that, like depending on what the error message says. Uh, or when they do talk to somebody or somebody who knows what's going on sees the error message or hears it, they have a better chance of being able to solve the problem faster because they have more information. Uh, many times when I've been trying to help somebody over the phone, they haven't been able to give me useful information. And the only way I've been able to figure out what's going on is by watching the server logs. Now, the average uh, tech support person is not going to have access to the server logs. That means they're not going to be able to see what's happening on their on the server side. And that means that they have even less information than I have available in many circumstances. So if the error message itself is more clear, has more useful information, relevant information in it, it makes troubleshooting things a lot easier. Now, 
it may sound like I'm advocating for detailed error messages that barf out all over the place and confuse the issue. No, I'm not advocating for that. There is a balance that has to be achieved here. Uh, you can't just have, uh, just barf out uh, all of the technical details of what was going on and be done with it. Uh, you can't list, uh, you can't just barf out whatever the underlying uh, system error code is and then, uh, you know, toss out some random things like server names and so on. Uh, you have to actually structure the message in a way that is intelligible. I've had error messages come out of software, web pages and whatever, that were, well... They had information that was useful for troubleshooting if you spent 20 minutes decoding it to figure out what it meant. Uh, some of it was just bad English or something like that. Uh, you know, some, some of it, sometimes it's just because the situation is that complex. But most of the time, the total uh, information is too much. Uh, like error codes, like Microsoft's error codes are not uh, terribly helpful as an information uh, uh, delivery vehicle. They are precise, and uh, that can help someone who knows what those error codes mean. But they're more useful for debugging the software than for actually dealing with routine error conditions. And that's, that's an important point. Routine error conditions. An error condition that's not likely to come up in proper operation of the system probably doesn't need a nice friendly error message. Uh, it can use obscure codes and so on. Uh, the uh, classic blue screen of death with back traces and so on on it. Uh, that's something that's not supposed to come up under normal operations. So it does it does make sense to make that a much more technical thing with uh, less clarity. But an error message that's likely to come up under normal operations, the network goes away, the mail server goes away, uh, the configuration's wrong for connecting to the mail server, that sort of thing. Well, that stuff should have sensible, somewhat human-friendly messages that, that go with it that should say something useful and they should include the information that would be necessary to uh, investigate that problem. So the server name, the port, the protocol, username, and then maybe, and not the password, but you, you know, because that's an issue, you know, you don't want to print out the password, but uh, the information that you have available that is actually relevant to what failed should always be there. Now, uh, from a software development point of view, uh, this is not an easy problem. Uh, it's not terribly difficult, but it's not easy because you have to evaluate every error condition and determine whether it's a routine error condition that can come up during normal operation or if it's something that should never happen or can't happen, but you're guarding against it in case something breaks badly. Uh, that's, uh, that's important uh, to consider. And of course, the easy thing there is just err on the side of assuming everything can come up in normal operations and put proper error messages in for everything. That is, though, a lot of work. But if you've gone to the bother of checking for it, you can go to the bother of putting an error condition, an error message in for it. Uh, now, I do have to admit, uh, in when I've been doing software development, I've usually been fairly lax on that sort of thing myself, so I understand how this mess gets out there. But even a bad error message that has details in it is better than a uh, error number zero type error message, where uh, which basically translates as, it didn't work. Uh, if you've ever been on the uh, receiving end of a call from a, from a family member or a friend uh, who uh, starts out with, uh, my email's broken, fix it, and then won't elaborate, and then you know what I'm talking about. Uh, 
too much information is usually better than no information whatsoever. So it's, it's a tough balancing act, but if you're going to make the error, err on the side of more information. Uh, so uh, that's this is why, uh, at, at great length, why uh, I'm distressed uh, somewhat by this trend toward hiding error messages from the end user. If you, we hide them, then the end user has no idea what's not working. It, it's like having uh, having your uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, It's like having a light fixture that uh, reports back to you that uh, something didn't work when you flipped the light switch. Um, yeah, well, you can tell generally that the light didn't come on, but it just tells you something didn't work. Okay. Uh, obviously, this would be with like the smart switches, right? Uh, the smart home crap. If it just said something didn't work, well, what would you do? What, what could you do? Uh, you know, uh, it's a light switch. It, it should either turn the light on or not. It shouldn't tell you something didn't work. It should just tell you that the switch is on or the switch is off. It shouldn't tell you the switch didn't work. What does that mean, the switch didn't work? Um, does it mean that the light's on and the switch won't turn off? Or does it mean the light's off and the switch won't turn on? Or does it mean the light's in both states? Or, uh, you know, it's a, a Schrodinger's light? Um, what? You know, you know, like you have to make sure that these, these messages make sense. But, you know, saying it didn't work, that doesn't tell you anything. Um, it, you know, uh, or you know, if your uh, car didn't start and you got a message came up on your dashboard that said it didn't start. Well, duh, I know it didn't start. It's not running. You know, that's a type of useful error message that we're getting these days is uh, the light didn't turn on. I'm looking at the light. Yeah, you're right. The light didn't turn on. Duh. Or you, or uh, your car didn't start, and I'm looking at the car. Yeah, it didn't start. Okay, tell me something I didn't know. Uh, so that's why these it didn't work type error messages are totally stupid. We know it didn't work. Give us some information on how to fix it, if you're going to do anything at all. With the case of a light switch not working or the car not starting when you turn the ignition, if you don't have more information, don't say anything at all. Like the classic interface for a, uh, a, you know, the classic light switch. You flip the switch, the light doesn't come on. You don't get any more feedback, but it's probably the light's burnt out or something. So you go through the usual troubleshooting. But if you flip the light switch, the light didn't come on, and a message popped up saying the light didn't come on, how is that more useful? Uh, so basically what I'm saying is these generic something didn't work messages are no better than saying nothing at all. So if you're going to put the effort to put these generic error messages in there, go to the effort of putting something useful in there. Uh, that's really what it's coming down to. Uh, just put useful messages in if you're going to put a message at all. Anyway, uh, that's probably enough rambling on this, uh, this uh, subject for today. Uh, if I keep going, I'll go off on 27 more tangents, and it'll be a five-hour video, so let's not do that. So anyway, if you want to be notified of future videos, make sure to subscribe, and if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.